Uh, just confirm if people are seeing this. Actually, I don't have any mates. So then just use the just uh, reduce the whole thing, and otherwise it becomes slightly quirky. Okay. Is everyone able to see on the meetings? Yes, this is in the meeting. Okay. And uh, second. Everybody. Oh, the slideshow mode. No, 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 don't go to the slideshow. Because people are seeing that. It's other actually coming way. fine on the screen. No, because what they're seeing is. What they're seeing is this. Yes. So move to the next screen. Uh, no. Uh, go back. They're seeing too much. I mean, they're hmm. seeing, seeing stuff they should not be seeing. Escape. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Escape and maximize this window. Hmm. Uh, however big you can make it. Is that maximize button working for you? Yeah. Perfect. And yeah, and close this. Where's here? Yeah. This one. This one, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah, and then minimize this. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the session on just the basic introduction of machine learning, and uh, we all have a fair idea of what do we mean by machine learning. Anyone wants to go forward and uh, just say like what they understand by machine learning? Nobody has an idea. <laughs> Everyone did the course. Yeah, and people raise their hands, right? They did the course and underwater graduation. Yeah, this is an online course. Now I know why you guys are not coding well. Coding well. Taking your courses <laughs> properly. No, anything, like anything whatever that it means to you. Like anything. So I think uh, machine learning, right? It's running a program. First, uh, when when I say the program, okay, you 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 pick up uh, uh, for the byte. I ask uh, uh, this program pick up pick up one digit from uh, one to ten, right? Hmm. First, uh, I said you pick up uh, uh, analysis that divided by three. Hmm. Now, first, uh, initially, this uh, program does not do analysis. It's pick up one. I tell him it's two, it's mm. it's, it's force. Uh, pick up a fourth, mm. force. Mm. Pick up a six, two. Mm. Then after a long, long time, it, uh, next time when it run again, it will mm. pick up a three, mm. six, nine. Yeah. So what Frank basically saying is like you basically train your program, right? Yes. So over the period of time, by the examples that you are giving, you are training your program to behave in a certain manner. That is one uh, definition that you can say to the machine learning. Other? Anything else? Like making your computer learning without giving explicit Welcome to the teleconference service. Please enter your instructions. 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 That is another thing. Uh, one more important thing I want to add to uh, this is like uh, we have a very important, always like any there form of learning technique, we have some kind of here. reference to that. Uh, like, road. let's say well, if we learn by example, or there is a reference of time, or there is a reference of outcome. So all this basically kind of classifies your machine learning into the different set of learnings that we know, like unsupervised, supervised, semi-supervised, or rule-based learning or anything. And uh, apart from that, uh, one important thing that comes is how your data looks. So all these categorization, the different categorization that we see comes on basis of this. Like what is the reference? What is the data? Is it labeled? Is it unlabeled? And how sparse it is? So all this kind of classifies what is the, like, the category of machine learning algorithm. So I will start with the Steve. You joined later. Uh, Manvi started with uh, Steve. Did you join? I don't think so. They are joined. I thought uh, I knew. Yeah, we need. We need. Okay. So I have two people. Yeah, nine to six to eight five four, right? Huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. No. Go ahead. Uh, Dias, uh, we need. Uh, uh, Manvi just started with her first chat where she was asking people to define machine learning from their perspective. If you wanted to add. Okay. There comes Steve. Is that Steve? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm here. He's okay. Okay. Can you define machine learning from your perspective? 
No, I'm asking him for serious. I mean, he he's he's done this course from Stanford of all the people. So um, man, we started this uh, discussion with asking people their view of machine learning. So just wanted to get your view on what is machine learning. Steve, I'm in the old place. Sorry, man, your voice has cracked up very badly. Can you try saying again? He said again? there's a lot of background noise or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We okay. shall skip. I'm at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is your bad luck, Steve. You will not. You will want to talk a lot during this session, but you won't be able to. All right. Anything you want to say about machine learning? Anything you want to say about how pathetic the Andrew Ng course is? You can say right now. All right. Actually, I love Andrew Ng. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So I will start with the first uh, supervised learning. So in supervised learning, the main uh, feature or the distinguishing feature is your data is labeled, and the goal is how you can make the predictions from that data. So, uh, like let's say these are your data points x1, y1, and so on to xi, yi, and they are defined in a d-dimensional space, and c is basically your uh, label space. So I will explain more in detail what does that mean. So x is your data. By data, that means your feature vector. and after that y is your predicted output or the output like let's say uh, the famous example that we see online all over uh, like let's say you have uh, the housing area and you are predicting the prices so your housing area those are your x values okay so those are your features for which you are going to predict that this should be the price of this much house location so that is your output So as I said, supervised learning is all about you have to make predictions from data. So like let's say uh, you have a training set, um, your training set says hundred square feet is hundred dollars, two hundred square feet is two hundred dollars. So that is your training data. Based on this training data, like let's say uh, someone ask you or ask your program, what should be the price of uh, the house with hundred square feet? so making that prediction is supervised learning and um, so yeah just a single data point is called a training example and the whole set of these points is basically your training set and making this prediction so mathematically speaking this prediction is done based on a hypothesis function this is your learning algorithm that is basically going to uh, tell you like based on this hypothesis function this should be your predicted output okay and by label space i mean uh so uh there can be the output to this problem can be a continuous output or it can be discrete categories okay like let's say in this housing example your output is continuous it will be some value there is no range to that it could be anything okay and when i say it's some discrete output like let's say uh let's say a face recognition system it have in its data set let's say 1000 faces which belong to some particular person so the output cannot be anything apart from those 1000 faces so that is your label space so there are two things the label space can be continuous the label space can be discrete and by d dimensional feature space i mean uh, right now i started with just saying that uh, the living area that is my one feature you can add one more feature like the number of bedrooms in the house whether it's a one story house or a two story house uh, whether there is a patio or not so all these factors that you are basically kind of uh, used to like let's say uh, signify that thing that is basically your feature vectors so that's why it's a d dimensional feature space and the goal is to learn a function h such that your function h predicts the correct output value of y so this is supervised learning okay i can't do that next next and as i said uh, so this is your example this is the living area the feet square this is your feature this is the price this is your output and this basically is your training set your prediction should tell like what should be the uh, price for the 5000 square feet area okay down down below it's not uh, yeah okay 
and uh, based on the label space when i said uh, like the output can be discrete or it can be continuous so the two major problems that comes with supervised learning is regression and classification when we say the target variable or our output is having continuous values it is called linear uh, regression and when we say the output can be uh, any of the discrete values from our set that problem is called classification and uh, the main uh, supervised learning like you will uh, hear these two terms very often the label data and the decision boundaries so basically all your problem rolls down to you have data and you know each data point signifies some label like uh, 100 square feet the label is the price like let's say 100 dollars and somehow you have to kind of make a decision boundary which is basically going to help you predict for any unknown feature the correct output okay so i just wanted to mention these two terms because uh, if you see any lecture or anything you are going to these are like the head words for supervised learning and as i told there can be multiple features so for a price prediction problem these can be the other features like whether there is a living area number of bedrooms are there balconies or fireplace etc and then there is a thing called assigning weights and parameters to features sorry to interrupt before you mm -hmm. go to weights parameters can you explain what is decision boundaries again mm -hmm. i mean is this the boundary across the whole data or what does it mean uh, so it is the boundary that is uh, like let's say the problem of regression i will explain in both the context mm -hmm. uh you have some data points mm -hmm. okay exam um, assume that in a two dimensional space mm -hmm. you don't have a white board the whole board is white right. mm -hmm. isn't it okay ओके So let's assume our data points in a two-dimensional space, and uh, I'm saying label data. So I'm using different uh, representation to uh, like kind of uh, represent those points over here. Let's say we have cross, 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 and we have squares, and then we have circles. So this is our label data. Let's say cross means all houses with 500 square feet. a uh, square means 700 square feet and the circle means 1000 square feet so when i said this is in boundary in the problem like regression so what i try to do is given this data i kind of try to segregate it okay so my machine algorithm should be a function some quadratic function or exponential function or anything it could be anything that is the main goal that we need to find out what kind of function is going to do the best segregation so that function indirectly is called this is in boundary oh is it yes that function is called this is in boundary that is basically your this is in boundary so what is going to happen is based on this why it is called this is in boundary is like let's say this is your equation your h so this is all is your x your feature vectors your function will be the some value of x and let's say it's some equation let's say some constant in uh, intercept b1 x b2 x square and just assuming that a quadratic equation is going to fit in this case so this is your decision boundary based on this like let's say a new point comes and it lies in this area and this is on the surface let's say start So this is your decision boundary based on your uh, this like right now the current situation it's going to predict that this house is lying in the 500 square feet area so probably the price for this like if the price for these houses is let's say 700 dollars so the house price house should be for this house should be 700 dollars okay so this kind of function definition makes sense for continuous data for sure right so this is How in the context of regression yes 
like let's say in the context of uh, classification so again we have the same kind of points i'm changing the problem because uh, this price prediction problem doesn't actually we can use it like let's say uh, we want to <coughs> we are given the houses and we are trying to predict whether these are like the family houses like the families are going to prefer more these kind of houses based on some features or is it going to be more popular among youngsters or uh, let's say like uh, because of that uh, school zone thing whether certain thing like that okay so right now i'm just making two categories family houses and non family houses mm -hmm. okay and so here there is going to be multiple features like let's say i'm considering two important features the size and the school district okay so these are my two features and based on that i'm going to divide my houses into two categories finally family and non family okay so this kind of problem is classification and in this case this is your decision boundary and let's say like if you want to have one more category like let's say youngster so there is one another cluster So basically, when you are doing the grouping like that, that is going to be your decision boundary in the case of classification problems. But question is, how does a label become a function of anything at all? A label become a function. I can imagine of a number becoming a function of something, but how does a label become a function of anything? So label exactly doesn't become the function. Here, like yeah. what I tried to explain so, is so 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 how are you mapping? Maybe my question is, and I hope somebody is getting my question in the intuition based sense that how do we map the label to the hyperspace or whatever to a? You can represent that with a number as well. So you assign every label a number, hmm. and then you can claim that is the map. But then that number should have a significance on a. Uh, yeah, it's from a functional perspective. It's not a unique number. It's just a unique number. Let's say we have hundred people here. Every person has one number, mm. and that number can be represented as a unique number, right? Okay, but then are we expecting the function to land us to that unique number? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And that number is what we use to compute the function. Ah. We were saying yeah. the function. Ah. Okay. So it takes yes. whatever is in your feature space mm. yeah. and maps it into that label space. Into so label yeah. space. Mm. So that's the simplest way of. Yeah, uh, that is actually a very nice explanation. Yeah. So that function is going to be something. Okay. There are different ways of doing it. So I couldn't totally hear what uh, Manu was saying, but um, his uh, summary that what you're calling a decision boundary is basically the regression curve that fits to the data. Regression curve, uh, Steve, or the classification, the different clusters that are being created in the case of classification yeah. problem. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, right. and uh, by assigning weights and parameters to features, uh, I mean that based on your problem, which feature feature is more important to you? Like, uh, let's say, so there needs to be a perfect weight ratio. That also again you compute by experimenting on your training data. So, like, let's say when we talked about these family houses, so school district gets the priority. Maybe. a uh, patio won't get the priority so those kind of weight values i uh, find out based on the problem and running it on the training data okay and uh, there are various kind of algorithms that we use to basically this linear regression problem few of them are like least square method gradient descent and all these uh, we will probably go through one by one in the future sessions so yeah and the next comes the problem of classification when classification i mean the output is going to be some discrete value from the output set okay and uh, there can be a uh, various kind of classification it can be binary where the output will be 0 1 or plus 1 minus 1 or it can be multi class classification So um, the example of binary classification can be a spam filtering. The simplest example where you basically classify whether your email is a spam or a non-spam, and multi-multi-class classification can be like a face classification. The way I said, so you have k different identities in your data set, and you are predicting which is which one. And when I say the output is a continuous output, that problem becomes your regression problem. 
like predict temperature or weather forecast or the height of the person. So all these problems are going to be a regression problem. There is no definite range to which their output belongs. Uh, there's one thing I would say, like mm -hmm. uh, classification and regression need to be put separate, like you can't put them in the same. Uh, so this, actually this, uh, actually uh, just to, like when I said that label space C, so I put them together just to explain how that label C basically kind of divides this supervised learning into two different sets. Yeah, they are both basically both different problems. And based on that C value, like if it's a continuous value, it's going to be a regression right. problem. Yeah. Hold on. So you're saying that no, no, but are they, are they, go ahead, sorry. They are the subset of supervised learning, yeah. Are they, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Hmm. Are they really saying that one can, I mean, are there methods associated with one which we are now because of this classification? I mean, when I say classification, because of this differentiation between the two approaches, deciding that only these approaches will be used here and these approaches, or you could actually interchangeably use them. You could map one problem domain to another. Yeah, you, you, could. Could. You, you could. You can. You could. You but, can. Um, so, so the school of thought uh, which I come from, um, the idea is a regression is a quantitative function. Okay. And a classification is a qualitative Qualitative function. But the function, I mean, when you're expecting a computer to understand it, it has to become a quantitative function, right? What do you mean by it's quantitative It's an implementation. Functions? Like, when, when you're implementing it, uh -huh. it's an implementation of how, how we implement that function, right? Finally, it will be <coughs> based on some numerical weights and some I mean, mathematical functions. There will be that. mathematical functions, but what Prasip so, is saying is... No, no, okay. What other non-mathematical way can a computer do something? So, to machine learning is not just, not just a computer-based thing, right? Then what is it? It was it's a broad subject. We are only looking at. So, I, I don't know. Maybe think of it. So, like the way I think of it is um, what we did: sentiment analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a classification problem. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you're computing uh, probability scores on which sentiment the whatever is most likely falling into, right? So you have a degree of confidence in that classification. So it can combine regression in some sense because that's where the confidence number comes in, but it's also classification. You were saying something. So basically what you are saying or what Pradeep wanted to say is like uh, the output of a regression problem will be some equation. Like in the sense, there will be mathematical calculations to come to that equation, but finally your decision boundary, it's going to be some equation. equation. Okay. Okay. And when you uh, talk about classification, mm. you did some mathematical computations to kind of form that decision boundary. But that's it. Like but you, what is the output of that? The different clusters. No, actually, but how do you think of the cluster? When I get the final I, I, sample, what Anshu is saying is, uh, can't they both be used in a very similar manner? They can be. They can they, be. They, they, can, they, can, be. they can be. My, my, my further question was on your qualitative definition. Whatever, What is the significance of a qualitative definition of a problem here at all? I mean. There is nothing qualitative about a computer. As far as a computer making a decision is concerned, right? They all have to be mapped to a quantitative definition, right? You were saying something. So as you say, like I mean, it depends on how we implement it. Mm -hmm. Let's say there are two different problems. So one is regression, other one is classification. So when we have regression, we care about every single point and we try to fit our curve as much as we can fit on our given data. Mm -hmm. Right? So we care about every single point. In classification, yes, you are right. You do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. But because you have two or three different classes, so you don't care about every single point, you only care about the reason. Yeah. yeah. So now, so let's say this is a one reason, then we have these data points and the other, other reason. So you don't care, so you only care uh, much about the uh, boundary there, you know, like in, in between, when you differentiate between two classes rather than the points in between. No, but the, the right? problem becomes the definition of what the region is, right? The mm -hmm. definition of the region becomes the problem. Yes, it is region. But the function has to help you define the region, or there is some other function which I'll is not you. the which is probably coming back to what you are saying. You still so, have to define the region. This is a smaller region, this is a bigger region, or is it just equally half? I mean, is this the region or is this this? Yeah, this so then you project it by that function. Right. right. And that function gives you the value if this value should be in n region, right? Okay. One hmm. question just one last question before you say what hmm. your point was on the same for the are we saying that when you said qualitative, right? I can insert an if-then-else logic yeah. into a classifier mm -hmm. 
which is really not an equation, mm-hmm. but it is really just making very deterministic jumps based on yeah. input values, and that is what makes it yeah. qualitative. Is that what one way of saying it? Actually, that's what your last question is trying to do. It's doing yeah. so many blends. So your if then an answer is there is a one type of classification called decision tree. Mm-hmm. That's completely yeah, if then else. If then else. Right. Mm-hmm. So try to learn those boundaries where I can put if then else. So decision mm-hmm. tree is a qualitative approach. Can we say that? It's because it's classifying. Yeah, it's classifying. It so yeah, it is qualitative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like little bit jumping forward, like mm-hmm. let's say the k nearest neighbor algorithm. So, if we do classification according to that, so uh, I just wanted to add or like explain in more detail what uh, Nitesh was saying. Mm-hmm. So, uh, let's say you made different clusters. Okay. So, each cluster will be represented by their mean value that we call a centroid point or something like that. So, this is cluster A. Let's say it's represented by its mean value M A. Similarly, M B and M C. So, if any new test point comes, we basically are gonna decide which cluster it belongs to by just comparing it to the mean values. That's what he means by like when we say that we don't care about each and every Understood. data point. But computing that mean value is a function. It's, <laughs> it's a mathematical function. problem. It's a mathematical, it's a mathematical function. function. Yes, right? and you can add if then else based on that. Like if your test point distance is closer to this, it belongs to this. So yeah. Okay. Non, just one point. Like you are explaining clustering in classification. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> no, so no, no, no. she's saying clustering is an approach to classification. It's an approach. To well, uh, it's not classification. It's not classification. It's unsupervised. Yeah, it is actually. Kn is unsupervised. Yeah, Kn, but Kn uh, comes in the <coughs> supervised learning context also. Yeah, you can you can do it both ways. You can do I mean, it both ways. I would say Kn is more. Uh, Kn means is clustering, but K nearest neighbor yeah. algorithm is supervised yeah, learning. Kn is not classification. You don't yeah. know the mean. Yeah. So first you define the mean, and then you define your cluster, and they keep changing. Yeah. So basically, there are two algorithms: k nearest neighbor, and that then there yeah, is k means uh, clustering. So k that. means clustering is basically <coughs> unsupervised. Let's not it yeah, yeah, like, it will come. But this is what. This is k means clustering. What you were showing there. Uh, I will come to you that. You were saying uh, k means is unsupervised. I mean, we were typically using it as supervised because we defined the k ahead of time. Oh, okay. I mean, how? Do you, do you, like, I mean, how do you have the label data? You don't know the Actually, there is a key nearest neighbor algorithm. I think I will come to that in two slides, but maybe more. Today. Even if you were defining K, that doesn't make it supervised, right? No, then you know. In our case, it is though because you have labeled data. Labels to the data. Already yeah. gives you the answer, mm-hmm. and you're training on the labeled data, right? Hmm. I mean, in in my example, okay. right? So uh, K means can be supervised or. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It can be both. Anything could be. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. And uh, the other two concepts space that basically comes with this form of learning is the loss functions and how we are basically gonna train our model. So by loss function, I means like let's say you come up with your uh, learning or hypothesis function H X. And the problem uh, in the most cases, in most of the machine learning problem, will be either to maximize this or minimize this based on your problem. Okay, so uh, how you're gonna calculate how accurate that is? So basically, there are different loss functions: uh, zero one loss, squared loss, or absolute loss. So when I say zero one loss, that basically is its output is gonna be zero or one. If you are uh, like when you test it on the test data, if your predicted output is same as the ex- like the required output, then it's one, otherwise zero. So that is your zero one loss. Squared loss is basically uh, the absolute, the way we take absolute. So that will be the mod of h x minus y square. And similarly, absolute loss will be just the mod of those two values. So uh, this is. Can I reject? This slide. Okay. Yes, sure. So when you think about loss functions, the reason why, the reason why we are talking about loss functions is because when you are training, a, a, let's take a supervised machine, mm-hmm. you are telling the machine. So uh, you can tell the machine you can be conservative or you can be liberal. Mm-hmm. When you want it to be conservative, you tell it your losses have a penalty. So every time you make a loss, you suffer so much of penalty. And when you are being liberal, your loss function could be very simple. 
and you could you could not penalize the machine every time it makes a mistake. So these loss functions are how you tell the machine how valuable or invaluable the mistakes are. So why would both calls one and not the other? What are they like? Why would one go for a non-conservative machine and say? So let's suppose um, let's take a problem, right? There you're just choosing between apples. You may not care if an apple is slightly colored, discolored, yeah, compared to an apple which is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you could say a uh, penalty for choosing a, mm -hmm. a slightly discolored apple is like huge. Mm -hmm. Then the machine will be very conservative. It will only pick apples which are very beautiful. So, so there will be a trade-off, right? Yeah. yeah. That's basically this, this is how you control the trade-off. Yeah. The loss is how you let me, let me Let me play back to you what you just said. Loss functions, the whole concept of loss functions is introduced for the purpose of giving some kind of feedback to the machines. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean I disagree with this. I think reinforcement learning is where we put this penalty and rewards into the system. But in supervised and unsupervised we are only aiming to reduce the loss. Right? Yeah, but there you're actually giving the feedback, right? No, actually I think <coughs> what Pradeep have said we can rephrase it like which problem we want to use which loss function. Yeah. Instead of saying the word penalty. Like, let's say if you are using the Apple classification problem, there we can basically use the 0, 1 loss or the absolute loss. But let's say if you are predicting based on the tumor images, whether it's a malignant or a non-malignant, so your error function should be more like attacking. So you will be using, let's say, squared loss because there your error is going to double with every incorrect prediction. So instead of saying penalty, we can say that like uh, which loss function we are using to kind of... Uh, uh, kind of test our algorithm that is uh, yeah hold on again <laughs> when you were first talking about this loss function i thought that it should be an easy mapping right at least between the first and the next two but the first one i would use when my data is label data and the next two i will use when my actual data is uh, continuous data right because uh, in label data <laughs> it is like a binary so Think, this loss right? function is, is that not the case? No. Uh, so uh, so all those? this loss functions can be used for all That's kind of label data. So give me an example where for a continuous data, I would end up using a zero one loss function, which means if it doesn't fall on the right thing, it's like a zero. Let's suppose your uh, your assumption of the function underlying function is that it's linear. Hmm. Okay. So then a zero one loss function makes sense. Because everything that doesn't fall in line hmm. is, ab is absolutely not true. Yeah. Is absolutely not true. Is that have, does that have to be the case? I mean, it's, it's oh, your assumption that's underlying. If you're choosing that, choosing that, that yeah. <laughs> okay. And in that case, you're saying it's a zero one loss function. You, you, I mean, you could use that. You could use that function. And then, what is the use? Okay, so now, again, going back to my original question, what do you mean by using the loss function? Where do we use it? Where in the whole flow of the machine learning or we telling machine more about the label data, where is this loss function used? Can you so uh, let's say based on your training data, you uh, did the learning, you have a hypothesis function. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when you try to measure its efficiency, so when you are actually uh, training the data, Mm -hmm. There is a very good chance the training error will be zero. Like let's say if we calculate the loss function on your training data, it should it will be zero. We will write it the error. It should be zero. Yeah. It should be zero. We will make sure, right? Yeah. But uh, and if you test it on the test data, test data. Okay. okay. So that times our uh, like there is the problem of like underfitting, overfitting. Okay. okay. So like let's say how generalized your model should be this loss functions are going to help you that there <coughs> might be the case with training error is zero but the testing error is very high so that means you need to be more liberal in your model so the error computation is through the loss function error computation the is through the error loss answer function that i arrive at when i'm using test yeah. data or even if i'm using iterative approach to create the training i mean to create the function hmm. uh, that error function is what the loss function is Yes. yes. This is how we calculate the error. Right? Error. Uh, at, using error. Error. Yeah. So Let's say we have data points. Hmm. Let's say it's a regression problem. Uh, exponential curve <laughs> fitted perfectly well. Okay. 
but when the test point starts coming there might be the case like that exponential curve is giving me very high test error mm. so that means i need to be liberal with my model maybe the exponential curve is not the answer to my problem maybe it can be some quadratic function mm. so which machine learning model is going to be best for me that is going to be decided ultimately with this loss functions <clears throat> okay okay so is this a like a, a newer metric like what i'm used to hearing is like recall and precision and stuff like that uh, so yes. i think they will come up later i think yeah those are also there yeah so uh, again loss function is what it is known as in the industry in some sense in the academic uh, sense or is there other names of this function error function or something else loss function loss function loss function is a very generic name yeah usually because people use mean squared error Okay, so that's why you they also call it like that. Yeah. So, so mean square is a loss function. Right? It's a squared loss. Yeah, it's a squared square loss. loss. Yeah. yeah. So I had a question. A little, like, I would still like, I would still classify a loss function. It's not even though you're not using feedback, you still have a loss function which still optimizes your yeah machine. What right? happens like, in reinforcement learning? We are using like a penalty or reward to tell the machine whether to go whether to take one action or second action. Mm -hmm. okay. Actually, we actually use a feedback there. Yeah. But here we don't. The machine does not have any feedback control. We cannot tell it based on the output whether it is doing right or wrong. Mm -hmm. What we do is we try to change our model. model. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Basically, yeah. we are using this for model tuning. Model tuning. This is not for. Uh, but this kind function, of using, it, this concept yeah. also applies to reinforcement learning or not? It does. Yeah. It does, but yeah. it but adds one more parameter. More based on so reward based approach. Yeah. yeah. So if a machine takes an action, we can actually tell it whether the action was wrong or wrong or right. And it will update its model itself hmm. according to that. Yeah, but you can tell it whether it was wrong or right as a binary, or you can tell it that it was how wrong or how, how right. Yeah, right? both can, yeah, both how can be done. That is what this would be, right? No. So he's saying like I mean, the dynamically controlling the loss function it means we are doing reinforcement. Hmm. Are we no no? Are we really dynamically controlling the loss function, or the function still remains the same, and the machine is doing something else to dynamically update its curve? So you can you can update your loss function controlling it. So you can have like a, let's say you have plus alpha, and that quotient you can. <laughs> yeah, understood. But that's not a condition for reinforcement learning. The condition for reinforcement learning is the function should update itself based on a feedback of the loss function's output. It's not like I mean the nature of function change. Like I mean it's like some some kind of like a quotient or something that will change. So that it's no, like that's what I'm saying. Will the quotient used in loss function change necessarily in reinforcement learning in the loss function? Yes. Yes, it will. The loss function. In the last one, so there are two functions, right? One is the function which the machine has used to get to the answer, and then the loss function is defining the error, right? Based on your knowledge of the actual answer, right? So there is the actual function which the machine is computing. So I'm being very sort of uh, naive here. So machine used its first. Hypothesis of a function to get to an answer. Mm. Now, using that answer, you compare it to the real answer. You use any of these loss functions. You, let's say you decide one uh, squared loss, right? Uh, with a constant in that squared loss computation, you feed that loss back to the the error back to the machine. Mm. The machine updates it. What is it called? Function, right? The main mm. function. The hypothesis. The hypothesis, the hypothesis right? That doesn't mean, and then it feeds back the answer to this guy. That doesn't mean that now this loss function has to change. Right? Actually, so same squared. So it doesn't mean. So the uh, way I'm, I'm trying to understand the information on me. I will take a simple example. example. So, yeah, yeah, the model, actually, the first equation that we used to derive it. Right? That has to change. That, that, that is changed. the concept of reinforcement. Right? Yes. That's what I'm saying, right? Yes. yes. So, but and loss may also change. That's a different thing. But no. Uh, Loss won't change. Should not change. Should not change. If in some sense, yeah. But eventually, it might change. Like, let's say there are five examples: e one, e two, e three, e four, e five, okay. and you have some loss functions values over there. Mm -hmm. And when the sixth exam, and then you have some reward value over there. Okay. So based on, and now some sixth example comes, and so all this reward values is gonna change as your function hypothesis function. Mm -hmm. Okay. And eventually, like let's say if the example e two repeats. And the model have already tuned. It might we might see that the loss function value reduces. Well, you 
but that would become but that would be right? like a separate, separate thing problem. it won't counter in your yeah. hypothesis function calculation okay. yeah okay yeah okay. eventually the outcome can change all right okay uh, did steve or somebody wanted to speak something i know there was some uh, unmuting yeah. on steve then <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, so, did I hear you say that the loss function is also sometimes referred to as like RMFE, like that kind of thing? Because that term I've heard before, loss function, I haven't heard before. Okay, this is what I'm trying to say. RMFE is a loss function. Loss function, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and uh, there comes uh, the different from one more different categorization that gets added over here is the discriminative learning and the generative learning mm -hmm. so in discriminated learning we kind of find out uh, the probability of the output cool. given the features mm -hmm. okay and in generative learning you basically take into consideration a prior like let's say you know the probability of y actually we calculate but we it's simpler to like let's say in some situation to calculate the probability of x given y like we are kind of reversing it so it's just a different form of classification depends on the problem set which might be more useful in that context so yeah give me an example like i understood the concept but can we talk about the example here and then uh, uh, that dot is there a significance to the dot there or is there oh, it's just a multiplication, multiplication. Yeah, yeah so there is a significance it's a multiplication right? of those two probabilities so that's what i want to understand using an example can somebody give so like the disease based example you used with a patient with a pre existing condition was like uh, uh, given a person with such and such conditions the probability of that person mm. uh, having a particular disease as opposed to that person mm. having a mm. rare condition and then given a set of conditions would have a different yeah. uh, uh, classification mm -hmm. i mean that I mean, that was the example that you know, that was the proper example that mm -hmm. no but essentially what we're saying is that we start with the uh probability of x given like so like let's say what example he used it's like cause and effect is being replaced by effect and, effect cause. and cause probability of and then what and how does it change the equation that's what i want to understand why so i'll go with sort of his example like let's okay. say you're trying to predict uh, again the tumor example mm -hmm. and uh, what should be the case uh, let's say we talk about the blood clot value let's assume there is something so uh, we know that this person is having the blood clot so we right. know that probability p of x given the value right we know there is a blood clot and there is what how many people have it right so this is one important feature like let's say these blood clots are the main cause that causes tumor i'm making a lot of assumptions okay. here okay so that in that case generative learning might be a better approach to kind of come up with the hypothesis function as compared to discriminative learning okay okay and if anybody can think of any example for discriminative learning nothing is clicking in my mind or otherwise i will come so, back to it later so a discriminative learning approach would be where um you don't actually have the uh, the complete figure like you don't have a complete uh, idea mm -hmm. and you're only estimating for that particular constraint mm -hmm. problem um a certain sort of problem Hmm. Instead of generative modeling, where you actually are trying to establish a function by itself, so this is like uh, think about this as um, somebody is allowing you to see part of a picture. Mm -hmm. You can either say, based on whatever I'm seeing, this is what it will look like, mm -hmm. or you can guess this is the picture. So generative modeling would be like you know what the picture is. Mm -hmm. discriminative learning would be based on what i see this is what my prediction mm -hmm. so that i mean that's how i think about it but there are different ways of I mean, looking at it too. i think we should probably we will go in more details in all the algorithms that time we'll come back to this later and i just want to understand the significance of the py also right hmm. so uh, the the difference being that there is a concept of py here yeah uh, which means so probability the overall of all probability of output the output hmm. in the whole data set in the whole data set right yes amongst all outputs amongst is that what we said yeah and in that context so that's a multiplier to the probability of x given y hmm. and that is giving us what it is giving us a function which can then be it's again to like we are calculating those p of x comma y right. just a different approach to calculate okay And, uh, I mean, I I think uh, pretty uh, kind of explained it hmm. well. Like in some sense, okay. Like if you think about labeled data, you have all of that data. It is labeled. That is part of your training data, right? So it makes sense intuitively that you want to predict the hypothesis given all this data that you already have. So that's the why, right? 
but then maybe in some cases it reduces the computational complexity uh, for you to think of it the other way, okay? What is the probability that my data fits this conclusion, right? So you're fixing the hypothesis, the, the output of the hypothesis function, you're fixing that and saying, what is the probability that this hypothesis makes sense? Or, sorry, what is the probability that this data makes sense given this hypothesis? Okay. And like, I mean, sometimes it can be used in classification problems where, you know, yeah, like the, the number of classification labels is, is a much smaller subset than, uh, I don't know, than the feature set or whatever. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, I was just saying like I mean, you can also think of, think of it like discriminative learning. It's more like uh, when you try to think it in a in a way that I have a labeled data and I try to identify my classes. So you try to learn the boundary uh, where, uh, between your classes, right? So it's like a software hardware. Other side, you can think of it like a reverse engineering. Like I know the classes and I try to think like how the data was generated so that these classes are. Created. So here you have more like a distribution of the classes rather than the boundaries between the classes. Okay, and uh, <coughs> then comes MLE and MAP. So these are like the most common ways you actually calculate those probabilities. And again, it's a different viewpoint. Like uh, MLE is basically about uh, you want to uh, maximize your outcome based on the observed data. So that is basically you have to choose your theta in such a way that it maximizes the probability of observed data. Okay, so that is MLE and MAP is basically based on like that you have some prior knowledge. You know the probability like the speed theta is your prior that is like kind of loop into your algorithm and then you are predicting the likelihood. So yeah, those are like just the two ways and sometimes this prior is comes from the past outcomes or sometimes this prior is like you fit some kind of distribution for your data like let's say you just um, add uniform distribution or Gaussian or anything so that depends on the problem so yeah I'm not going in much into detail how it comes to this equation what we do and what all yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Okay. So basically the main idea, the what should be the get away from this is, there are two ways. Basically you can calculate the probabilities from data. One is the maximum likelihood estimate, where the purpose is you need to <coughs> maximize your likelihood given the observed data. And the other is map, where you have some prior knowledge. This prior knowledge could be from some past outcomes, or it could be from some kind of distribution that you are trying to fit into the data and then you are kind of predicting the likely or like the outcome. So these are just the two ways to calculate the outcome. Yeah. But this is a probability of functions you don't know. How, how, how can you get to these functions? How can you get to these functions? Uh, so like I didn't understand like can you? So, so this is a function, so this is a yes. the function, so where, where, where it come? So where it comes, let's say a simple uh, coin tossing example. Mm -hmm. So let's say winning, getting ahead is a win situation. Yes. Okay, so huh. we have to find out like our algorithm needs to find out what kind of things can, uh, how can we toss the, like how many outcomes we will toss and it will be head and that will be your winning outcome, right? Yes, yes. So uh, how do I fit? Okay, so your theta is getting ahead. Yes. And your data is basically like, let's say if I'm flipping it to twice, how many permutation combinations can be there? So that way so you, 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 you calculate that, yes, those probabilities. So this, this property is it's something existing, you just uh, 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 do some hmm. uh, mathematics, so not computation from your test, right? They're not a computation. Uh, actually, uh, like even if you're computing from the text, Yes. You basically like, let's say we are looking at the text recognition problem. We are looking for the total number of times the word Watson is used in a document. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your outcome is Watson. Okay, so calculating the probability mm -hmm. of Watson. So even if it is in the context of text, 
it ultimately boils down to how you calculate these probabilities. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay, so I mean, it's, it's not an easy answer, Frank. Right? Uh, I mean, a lot of times, at least, yeah. You know, in my academic experience, people start with sort of cookie cutter, uh, assuming linear models, that sort of thing, and they start with that, and then they see what kind of accuracy and precision they get from that, mm -hmm. and then they tweak, right? So maybe they weight a feature more heavily than other features, or maybe they see that this feature is too dominant over the results, and so they drop that feature to see what happens, you know? So there's like a lot of different ways that you tweak the model, and in general, like all of the algorithms that um, Manu is talking about, then abstract into a higher class of generalized linear models. Um, in which case, you know, if, if Poisson doesn't float your boat or Bernoulli or Gaussian or whatever, then mm -hmm. the generalized linear model basically like lets you tweak every aspect of mm -hmm. the equation. So that's like definitely way researchy, but. Uh, but, you know, so you just kind of start with the basics and then tweak from there. And am I say, jumping the gun too much when I say that it is the generalized linear model which is what has been the basis for neural networks because that's what they manipulate, they, they try to manipulate every possible feature. Is that mm -hmm. correct to say conceptually? So basically all those hidden layers that are there in the neural networks, mm -hmm. that is like your linear, linear, linear models which are combined in different layers to somehow kind of model the non-linear behaviors. So you tweak at different, different extent at the different layers. You can say that. So, so <clears throat> the neural network essentially is solving the, uh, again, the hardest problem at outset or, or solving it in the hardest way at the outset. Is that what we can say? I don't say hardest way as in, uh, it's, so a neural network, I mean, it's not trying to, it's trying to model the brain. Hmm. It's more trying to model the brain where it thinks uh, a machine learning system can be constructed by building up networks of <laughs> linear, I mean, perceptrons or a neural. <laughs> okay, I, I, so I, I don't want to go into the theory of that right now. Yes. I apologize, I got it up, but I was just asking a very sort of, and you can say no, that, hmm. that's not the way to think about it. Uh, but a neural a neural network is an instance of a GLM. Like any machine learning algorithm uh -huh. is an instance of a GLM. Mm -hmm. uh, the GLM is like, you know, if you think okay. about first order logic and like trying to use first order logic to prove associativity and commutativity and stuff like that. So like those are instances of first order logic proofs, right? In the same way that a neural net, uh, a k-means classifier, whatever is an instance of a GLM. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is k-nearest neighbor algorithms. Uh, this is the supervised counterpart of k-means clustering that we all have heard. So the basic assumption of this algorithm, or one, what it governs, is that similar inputs have similar latents. So uh, this is basically used more in the classification supervised learning algorithm problems, not in the regression much. And here the classification rule is for any test input x assign the most common label amongst its k nearest neighbors, okay? So like, let's say we have uh, 20 data points and we decide uh, k should be five. That means for each data point, you are considering five neighbors and uh, the label of that point will be the most common uh, label among those five neighbors, okay? So, so that like is it's, the simplest way of thinking about this is if I know your friends, I know who you are. Yeah. So whoever is around, around <laughs> you, you belong to the same. Yes. Same but then, uh, how do you? That is a question. You just define this very discreetly. Uh, <laughs> similarity, yes. right? How how do you define the notion of okay. similar inputs? You have metrics. You have metrics. So you basically calculate the distance. Like again, your feature vector <coughs> will be created. Like, let's say I am interested in snowboarding. Pong is interested in snowboarding. Okay. And let's say Saurav is our friend. So we are predicting he's interested in snowboarding. So there will be a feature vector based on that. Like, let's say but isn't my that feature, feature vector definition also a problem. 
Yes, so, yes, it is. So it I is. Think what I should say, we can use any kind of similarity yeah. to calculate between two data points. And that's the problem. So if you use different similarity measures there, the result will be different. Will be different. Right? Will be different. So like the distance that we are calculating between those two data points, we can use Euclidean distance, you can use Manhattan distance, you can use Got it. So that that is the Then selecting this, that distance uh, This problem works this approach works well for problems where Mm -hmm. We have a very good approximation of similarity. Yes. In the context of the problem. Yes. Right? Well, you have an estimate that is good. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, again, I am again thinking from a computer's perspective. If a computer was to try to do this, mm -hmm. a computer may not even know what similarity function to use because the first job for the computer would be to understand the similarity function mm. in play here. Mm. I mean, like the, the worst part is like you don't even know what your feature is. Feature yeah, is, but exactly. The computer doesn't know what the feature vector is. Exactly. So, when so it doesn't know what, how to even get it get into that place where it can build a function for you. Yeah. yeah. Like let's say when you're doing string matching or something like that, uh, we are trying to like uh, let's yeah we are doing string matching okay mm -hmm. and uh, there are different measures from which we can calculate the similarity between the two texts okay and uh, when I'm calculating the similarity so again that notion of training data validation data and test data comes mm -hmm. so computer doesn't know on its own <clears throat> like let's say you started with one similarity measure you started with let's say Euclidean distance and you see with the training data also you are not seeing this is not the similarity measure that you know, needs to be used. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say I'm comparing, uh, I have profiles on different social media websites and uh, I'm cal kind of uh, calculating the similarity metric between the username and the my first name or the last name. So in that kind of context, which similarity metric will be better? So you have 10 training data set examples and by there you have to take the intuition. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Hmm. Uh, You'll try with 10 different measures and then you will see this is the similarity metric which kind of gives me better estimate <coughs> of the string matching over here. Mm -hmm. You build up your model based on that. I but then you're basically saying that you're deriving a feature vector based on uh, learning the, I don't know, based so on looking at the data set in its classification and its label, right? Uh, but then a lot of times, feature engineering is does come from domain knowledge expertise, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, oftentimes you start with a fairly small number of features, yeah. and then mm -hmm. based on you know what that looks like, like Manu is saying, maybe you introduce more features based mm -hmm. on the the feature weights that you learned from a prior iteration of the machine learning algorithm, right? So you can kind of keep building on features. For me personally. Feature engineering to me is the most interesting part of AI because it does require you to intuit uh, aspects of the problem and that's what I find most interesting. So, Some people question. find the math most interesting. But question. And again, where I'm trying to get to with this is I'm trying to understand if there is a leap which is eventually made uh, in deep learning with respect to the traditional approaches and if there is some part which we do today is in traditional machine learning algorithm which is getting short circuited. That's where I'm trying to get to. And uh, no. feature engineering wise, it is still not short circuited because we still no. have to define the features. Yep. Uh, yeah. so, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go what ahead. I'm trying to say here, so uh, that's the most uh, hardest and important part here yeah. in traditional machine learning approach that you have to do feature engineering. Yes. Right? So we have, if we have a limited amount of training data, we, like we, are completely dependent on the, our, our features. Mm. Like if our features are good, then our machine learning algorithm will work better. But imagine like we have a lot of data, mm. then we might not need to do so much feature engineering because we might have a good algorithm that mm. would do the feature engineering itself. Mm. And that's how neural network works. So tell me this, right? in absence of neural network, uh, if I have a, still have a lot of data, mm. there was potentially algorithms which work mm. well with feature mm. engineering, Without feature engineering, without feature engineering, it would not it work. Would not, it would not guarantee. It's very much dependent on your feature engineering. Mm. That's why I'm saying that is exactly what I'm asking. Right? No, 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 guys. So, so, the, so, so then you are coming back to my point and confusing me a little bit now. Oh, sorry. That no, no, no not sorry. I mean, uh, is there something in the design of the whole neural network uh, flow that 
automatically starts with an infinite set of feature conceptually mm. and reduces it to the exact feature that matter or it is not even a it is not even a problem for it because it fundamentally assumes infinite features but that's not the case right it has to have features yeah. so you take everything i mean there are unsupervised learning algorithms that will learn features yeah. for you mm. now they're not mm. there's no semantic meaning to those features it's just yeah. you know some number right mm -hmm. but yeah mm. there are unsupervised learning so I mean, I don't know if these guys have more recent data, but like when I was taking these classes, generally speaking, supervised learning provided better results because of the fact mm -hmm. that there was domain expertise associated with it. So before I mean, we any unsupervised learning, you can tweak. So before we go to that, right? The input data, the test point or the input data, has to be first describable in terms of features, right? Yes. The input data could be just an X, or the input data itself is an equation uh, yeah right? that was, that's mostly true um, well there are that is what features are right yeah. the yes, input yes. data is actually I, an equation I, I, of the feature i agree with mm -hmm. that but mm -hmm. uh, there are ways of looking at the problem which does not look at features at all so the, i mean i'm saying well, yes, and I, left, but that's also possible. no but uh, okay I, so i'm just again trying to think aloud how to yes. even mm -hmm. but traditionally you, you have to you have to make a problem with a fixed set of features a fixed set of features mm -hmm. right now, there well, is all the big difference is that they're not labeled in unsupervised, right? Yeah. You're no, no, I, I, exactly. Computer. I'm not. I'm not talking about that. So I'm not even going to unsupervised. I'm talking about firstly that without even talking about uh, how many features or which features are useful, there is always a thing that the input data is actually a sum of all its features. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Right. The hmm. input data is always yeah. a set of features. Yeah. Set of features. Yeah. Yeah. It could be two features mm -hmm. because you had the energy and the knowledge and the capacity to describe only those two features, mm -hmm. or you had the computing capacity to describe, mm -hmm. or it could be hundred features, yes. yeah. yes. yes. example, like or even a million features. Yeah. So you do test classification. Every word is a feature. Every unique word is a feature. Every unique have a one million features. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could right. And if you take took that uh, home problem, mm -hmm. all right. You could potentially classify it to a couple of dozen features, which includes color, size, mm. location, geographical location, blah yeah. blah blah. True. Right now, now I am I am a data scientist. Mm. I have input, which is a home. Mm. That home is a function of and number of features, mm. and there is always an upper limit to it, which could be infinite, mm. right? Or not infinite. There will be actually a limit to it, right? Features cannot always be infinite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, theoretically, theoretically, assume that I have all my features available mm -hmm. in some storage space. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I could start my whatever next step mm -hmm. with all the features. Mm -hmm. Right. All the n available features which describe our thing. Mm -hmm. So now, before going to the next step, now coming back to your points about unsupervised learning, which will do feature engineering or not engineering, mm -hmm. is there a step? Which, based on the approach which which we are choosing, which becomes mandatory to do, to arrive at some number, which is a equation based on all those features to describe the input, right? Mm -hmm. To describe a house, that house number one, right, is labeled as family. House number two is labeled as non-family. House number three, that has no meaning because I am essentially creating a label to a label map. Right, that house number one has to be described as a function of all the features of that house. Mm -hmm. That's actually a class. That's what you're. That's what we are doing as a classifier. A, this is the classifier. That itself is the classifier, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But so then, I mean, a lot of times though, the next step mm -hmm. would be to do feature proving, right? So let's say you come up with a thousand features that you think are just the most wonderful feature set in the world. But then you do feature pruning and either you do PCA mm -hmm. or you do like a, I, apply a distortion I, matrix yeah. or something like that. And then you realize that these two features are heavily correlated or they don't add any new entropy into the mm -hmm. into the results. And so you can discard those features. Understood. So but that's, that's typically why, a next step. Again, that's why I might understand that you started with a feature set and then there was a human in the loop which made a decision to discard these features, right? I mean, 
two features may actually have been this exact Not same feature. Not necessarily a human, right? Yeah. You can algorithmically yeah. apply yeah. a distortion yeah. matrix. Yeah. So you don't necessarily yeah. need so, a human to do that. So then, so then, let's go back to that point, right? Which you said, a, 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 an algorithm which will make a feature selection, mm. right? What is it doing? To do feature selection, is it trying to, again, do feature selection using the knowledge of the label data, which is an output of the problem, or it, it is doing feature selection independently of the output? So, the best way would be to use the output. So, there is a very simple example here. Mm -hmm. So, let's say I want to reject some of the features. Mm -hmm. I will try to see the correlation between every feature. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, that can be independent of the output. Yeah, that can be done independently. Mm -hmm. so like for example, like whole line is same, I can remove this. Yeah, it is one, 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 two. Yeah, that's it. So that is one example. So that is an example of how we did feature elimination without even going to the output. Right? Uh, is there ways when we do feature selection in conjunction with the output also? You can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, but but imagine that that would also lead you to uh, our figure. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. because now if I reject the image based on what you already have, you are taking data set. Got it. Got it. So, so then, <coughs> then again, now going back to my original uh, sort of desire of understanding where is the leap in neural networks and hmm. deep learning. Hmm. Is deep learning designed with the assumption that I should always start with all my features? Whosoever has understood and uh, done more of deep learning. So it's not like, I mean, you start with your own features, mm -hmm. but you can, that's the option, because I will put the layers, and those layers will decide, mm -hmm. right? If I should try to merge these four in one I can't layer, hear the thing. How much, huh? Uh, uh, you come, 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 No, it was the same, I mean, he, he was asking, like, if I have a, a deep learning architecture, any of the architecture, and how do I use my features? So I'm saying, like, I mean, you can start with all the feature set, and those feature sets certainly, uh, Reduce into some of the some less feature set, right? So I try to merge. Let's say five. There are five feature value, and I try to represent that with one particular value. And how? So I keep propagating. I as I, not I computer is doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean computer. <laughs> and I really want to make a distinction between human and the computer. Yeah, computer is doing that. Right? Computer is So so let, let's say like the simple architecture here. If I if you see here, like I mean, they have like uh, hundred points. Mm. <coughs> I give these hundred words. On the second layer, I have le let's say 50 points, right? So every point goes to it, to every point on the uh, on the second layer, yeah. And it tries to reduce like how I can represent the number. So let's say I start with one 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 one, and then I try to see if this one should change to represent this data better. Very simple, right? And then I can put more layers there, and add it, add as it goes to the final stage to see if I am predicting it right, right? I can come back back propagation then go. No, again, the, the approach aside, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there is a very nice definition of this in the literature of whosoever even introduced deep learning, right? I've not read those papers, man. Uh, but uh, was the desire, mm -hmm. was the goal to eliminate the need of feature engineering for deep learning? Simple question. Or maybe the dependence. Was there a I think the dependence Sorry? on features. So, I mean, in my experience, deep neural network is not about feature engineering, right? It's about a, a, a deeper model representation of the problem. Uh, I know that sounds generic and vague, but... You know, it's feature engineering, right? So, no, 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 yeah, so you start with in, uh, what about the all features, the features. Features are just a representation of your of, of one one representation of your problem. Yeah. 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 It's a model, yeah, now, right? Now it's like a, have this is not more. Like like features are model. trying to tell you a story, but you can't say everything itself is a story. Like story is the is the whole thing, right? It's not mm -hmm. understood. But if you think about it, that model mm -hmm. becomes that original classification function, mm -hmm. which you were talking comes from the features, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I want to write a computer function which is composed of all the features, right? Wherein Zero is the weight for some of the features. Mm. Okay. Right? That that deep learning thing is also trying to build that complex model essentially, right? 
but you are not giving as a human, you are not giving further input further to select the Yeah. Yes, that is exactly the thing. That's the, I am not giving it any input to select the features. I am giving it all the features. Yeah. Yes. And in other element, you are doing <coughs> you are doing it yourself. So, so, so yeah. you are answering my question. You are basically yeah. saying that the gen, the goal of machine learning or deep learning has been to not do feature engineering. It's not the it's not human feature in It's okay. not do human, human feature. It's like reducing well, the reduction, feature reduction. No, 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 no. I mean, to, that's what I'm saying. The goal of the yeah, if you have is for the computer yeah. to do on your behalf you have, what you are trying to do. Mm. You are like, you are like, like because or you can if say you have that a very good amount of data mm. represent yes. your whole instances. Mm. Yes, that's true. You will not need to represent your feature job. Mm. Yes. And now what I'm saying is that there is of course Given that that is possible in deep learning, you can also make it faster. Of course, your deep mm. learning can take a lot of time versus it can take a little lesser time and be smart about it mm. by reducing that initial feature space. Instead of giving it 1000 features, yes. you can start with the top 100 features which you think. Very, now you're not sure about these 100 features also. Many yeah. of them would be useless or many of them would be very good. Yeah. But you don't spend too much time trying to figure out which then yes. I apply yes. Yes. So you spend more time on how to plan your architecture, architecture. To, pro yeah. to produce your yeah. problem rather than doing feature engineering. To, like, so I can put like different yeah. layers. I can also fuse <laughs> these layers. I can put different kind of layers, hmm. right? I can do, uh, okay. let's say I know so, at this layer, sequence may matter a lot. So I will put sequence there. So let's, I mean, so let's, we'll get to that when we actually come to layers. Right? Yeah, because yeah, I don't yeah. understand that concept. Right? Mm, right? Actually, so so let, let me, maybe if I could give a concrete example. The way we think of deep learning, or the way I was taught deep learning, is let's say you want to do object recognition of a photo and you want to learn people in a photo, right? Or objects in a photo. How would you do that? First, you, you the computer knows nothing about people, right? But you can, at the lowest level, you can start with edge detection, right? And then edge detection can be abstracted into, I don't know, primary shapes. And then primary shapes can be abstracted into blah, blah. So at each layer, it's a different model that uses the input from the layer below it. So it's no, a hierarchical so right. structure. Uh, no, no. Are you saying each feature corresponds to a layer? No. 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 So it's like so a each layer has its own one way sees the lines. Right? Mm -hmm. The guy above him sees all these lines connected in some way. <coughs> the guy above him sees this whole shape. Mm -hmm. The guy above him actually sees the picture. So that's what uh, I think uh, sees the explanation of. I think but that again, okay, yeah, that and there can there can be different concept. features at each layer, right? So edges have features that are distinct from boxes or something, which are distinct from like people like faces have hair color, have, you know, blah, 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 whatever, right? So those are features at that layer. I They're understood, different from I understood. Steve, but isn't it almost like saying in a very intuitive manner, okay, that these edges are a higher dimensional feature in itself, right? That edge is a feature, color is a feature. So if you think about the brain really, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you cannot explain those features because they are mixed. I understood, you know, yeah, I understood. Yeah, yeah. and that that's is why you're using because the same way the brain, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. So any other, I mean, it's not only neural network, there are other models. So the basic idea is dimensional reductions, hmm. right? So you have so many features and you represent them in less dimensions. Less dimensions. So like hmm. if you heard this thing called latent semantic analysis, that also does like this dimension. Hmm. Okay, so right? got it. So yeah. the damage, so is that layering about, again, we'll, we'll come back to this, but hmm. essentially it's about then the engineering is about that that dimension that reduction. Dimension reduction. Is that what you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. So now we'll understand this point. Yes. Sorry. No. And uh, I think uh, the two most intuitive things we can take till now, till we move to deep learning, is this feature selection, uh, or is basically your features should be very independent. It should not change over time. So all those feature properties are there. Like let's say I consider this room, and if I want to make or like say what are going to be the features of this room, I will probably say the corners of the room because that's not going to change. Even if I take the pick from any angle, they are going to be constant. Okay. And let's say the boundaries of the doors on the ball, these are, these are going to be remain constant. If I, even if I take pick from any angle, mm -hmm. so that comes in feature engineering. And uh, as we move from conventional machine learning to like, let's say deep learning, the intuition is, reducing the efficient or like or like saying reducing the dependency of your uh, 
algorithm efficiency on how effectively you have uh, taken the features. You can say that. Very intuitive, very vague, but that could be one of the motivation eventually. Like uh, if we take any supervised learning or unsupervised learning algorithm, ultimately it bottles down to how effectively you have selected your features. But with deep learning, because of the multiple layers, because of the multiple layers in which we are doing this feature extraction, we kind of uh, reduces those gaps. I mean, you, you, even you don't need multiple layers. Right? Even, so, so yeah, it depends. Yeah. Like model, depends. It depends. All people talk about yeah. is word to back. It's not deep learning at all. Because there is just one layer. There is just one layer. So that's why I'm saying, like, I mean, it depends like how good the presented data you have, what you mm -hmm. want to learn. And that's the only And so, uh, just just one thing uh, here. <coughs> if you break down and shut me up if you think that I'm going off the bend, if you break down uh, the notion of from a machine's perspective, just like think the way, <laughs> what are we trying to recognize? Right? What? And this is where we come to the term signals, right? <laughs> that what we are really trying to recognize is a set of signals that have been given to the brain or to the computer, right? Mm -hmm. So in case of uh, object recognition, this is what we're doing. I'm getting a set of signals. Now, I don't necessarily consciously think about it as edges I'm looking at or depth I'm looking at or color I'm looking at or size I'm looking at. It is a signal which can be quantified through some very atomic things like essentially a visual signal is a combination of depth width, height, whatever, so, sort mm. of these mm. features and colors, right, and brightness. And so there must be some things, right, brightness, colors, edge, uh, no, not edges, dimensions, mm. this, that, right. Mm. And that is what is changing. So when I see a corner, even when I see a corner, it is actually a changing notion of a depth or changing notion of a color that is making me think that there is a corner there, right. That's right. exactly right. There yeah. is no inherent knowledge. Yeah. My knowledge. any layer of my brain is using to define yeah. a corner before it is recognizing, yeah. right? Yeah. It is just trained exactly. itself. Right? It's I don't right. know the nerve yeah. corner, right? right? So it is a set of it fundamentally breaks down breaks down to the most atomic signals mm -hmm. which are composed to form this input. Right? right? In, and it is easier to think of in terms of images or sound, because in images <laughs> it is this thing. Yeah. In sound, it will be pitch, uh, loudness, and whatever yeah. variation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Now, if you think about text, hmm. it is the combination of letters. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know how to call, yeah. quantify yeah. that yeah. signal, right? Yeah. Now, when I give, again, we should be able to get this answer hopefully when we get to deep learning or understand this better, is that when I give an image to a deep neural network, and when I'm trying to replicate the brain, am I also having to tell the deep neural network that, hey, look for corners, look for edges, look for colors, look for these five things, or is the deep neural network with a much uh, even lesser sort of uh, inputs from the human or the algorithm designer able to decide what it needs to look for? Yeah. Right. Women That's what I'm, yeah, so don't women don't need to specify. Sorry, women don't need to give further yeah. input. Yeah. So, so you give all the images. Give the explicit input, right? mm. So, so the label is human the only gives yeah, the image. image. Human only gives the signal. Yeah. Nothing besides the signal. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It depends how your architecture is. So that's <laughs> why I'm saying what women can do, mm. if he knows the problem well and he knows how my brain works, he can play the but he can trace the architecture rather than playing into the how we should work. But the architecture is what? Architecture is, I'm really sorry, one way I think, uh, is a set of layers, right? Those layers, it's not only a set of layers, it's also a type of layer, how you're... Okay, so that, that will understand when we come yeah. to this, which yeah. I don't understand at all. All right. All okay, right. so coming back to K-Nearest Neighbor Gordon, here uh, the model says similar inputs should have similar labels or similar outputs. Okay, so basically you're calculating the mode value. Like let's say the test input comes to like five neighbors and if four of uh, them is plus, so the label for the test input will be plus, that way. And then comes the other set of uh, learning techniques. Uh, they are uh, unsupervised learning. Here the main uh, distinguishing thing is like you have unlabeled data. You don't know uh, 
what these data belong to. So you have to draw inferences from the data sets consisting of input data without labeled responses. Like you just randomly have data and you need to cluster them or neural networks or anomaly detection, everything comes in. And uh, so it's like neural network, say, like, hmm. it's not uh, put under unsupervised learning. It's, it's just, under both. Yeah. And even it's more popular under classification. Classification. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because if you, if you have a good training, then you. Yeah. Hmm. The, the, you use KNN as just an example? Or it's one of the algorithms that you can use for uh, supervised, supervised classification. But, uh, my question, I, I, I just got curious when you moved on with just one example. Hmm. Was it just. Is it the most significant and the most it's representative the most common, example like, of supervised learning? Most learning? common and the most basic. And why you use that? Is most that basic. The most basic. Say. Most mm -hmm. basic. Okay, but there probably are many. There are many. Very there is discriminative analysis. Least, actually, I covered up uh, like the most basic for the classification problem and uh, the similar counterpart for the like. Uh, Do you mind adding problem. one slide to this just for? Uh, yes. Where, I the least it. square method. To yeah, talk I mean, about it would be better, like, I mean, for, for me, let's say not talk about the unsupervised learning here. Mm -hmm. Let's first talk about, okay, how the regression. So we talk about more detail, how curve fitting is there, and then try to show you the function and the that log, log function, like calculating that on the, on the board. And also a little bit talk about the, uh, some kind of classification method. And then come on. Here. So how many slides more left for this particular? Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> there are like... Can be covered later, right? Yeah. Okay, maybe what we'll do is, if you also at the end of the so thing, I can, can we have a simple... I can just I, show the simple MATLAB demo uh, that I have awesome, for the awesome. linear regression. And uh, then we can deal in more detail, like how basically we calculate. So I'm using the least square method mm -hmm. uh, for doing that curve fitting over there. Then we can go into the mathematical details of how it has happened, what are the drawbacks, and what are <clears> we doing. Do we want to so do, a, uh, do a discussion, and we can do this next time, on at least having a discussion between difference between supervised and unsupervised? Mm -hmm. You want to do that right now, or we can do that after your demo, or we can just do it's it. It's just a very small demo. I will just explain, not going much today, like what it is and how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's over actually. 4.30. Okay. So, I just basically uh, loaded one of the sample data set that is available within hey, the MATLAB. People on the system may not be able to see okay, it. Okay, I don't know how to. Window. It's already maximized. Not sure how to do that. Text, 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 text. text. Third, 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 third. third one. Third one. Okay. Yeah. Increasing. Okay. <laughs> Is it something happened? No. In no right. In there. In there. Okay. No, no, that's indent. Indent. Many can't get out. Font size isn't there. There's no font size. Forget There's no font. Okay. Hi, indent. Okay, yeah. Okay, so basically, it's just a sample data set. Uh, this is some accident data set that MATLAB have uh, on it. And what I'm just doing is I'm just uh, running it and uh, just so that you can see in a graph. Can you at least talk about what is an accident data? One is what is the input point? What okay, I will show. Data? Yeah, once again. Yes, it. So basically what you are having over here is uh, there is a population of state mm -hmm. and based on that population, how many yeah. accidents happen per state. Oh. So this is basically your data. Okay, as you can see, all the data points are there. And uh, let's say you need to make a prediction. Let's say in the population of state, when it's three into 10 to power seven, uh, how many accidents are gonna happen? So what we are gonna do is we are gonna fit uh, it's a problem of linear regression. Mm -hmm. We are going to try to fit a curve which basically makes the most accurate prediction or kind of... Uh, you just said it's a problem of linear regression. Who says it is a problem of linear regression? <laughs> Actually, okay. it's Why? a problem of regression, not linear regression. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a problem. Okay. It's just, yeah, a, it's just yeah. a problem. It's a problem of regression, I can understand. Regression, because not linear it's a regression. Problem which we try to apply the method of regression. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so, so you're basically saying let's try linear regression. Let's try yeah. linear regression. Okay. It's yeah. not nobody says it's a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's a regression. You kind problem. of infer that based yeah. on the sort of shape that the data is made. Yeah. So yes. that's, that's what I want to understand. Yeah. Like, yes. Okay. Looking at the shape, <laughs> we can think of this as a linear regression yes. because it looks linear. That's yes. what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
okay and uh, it's this matlab or what okay and okay uh, which one is the location uh, so uh, in this code what I have done is like first I'm just uh, one hand plus actually that didn't work it doesn't work okay oh sorry yeah I tried to make this okay so there are two things here right now we are doing uh, like uh, two plots that I'm gonna plot one is basically first calculating the coefficient uh, if you can see line number five, where basically I'm using the least square method. Mm -hmm. This is one of the regression method to calculate the coefficient for the equation where your output should be the multiplication of that coefficient B1 into the input vector. Okay, so uh, the first plot is going to be about that and the next plot will be I'm adding one intercept B0. And here, what I have done is just added 101. So it's a matrix of all one values. And so these are all like kind of, uh, what should I say, trial that you do first coming before, like this is your model, okay? <coughs> so just to compare how we do this curve fitting, okay? So these are the two things and we are using the least square method. And if you publish, okay? So these are the two things. Uh, the bold line is the regression output or the regression decision boundary. When you just have uh, B into X, you don't, uh, you are not having any constant intercept into that. And as you can see in this case, both of it is almost same. So yeah, it doesn't help. Apart from that, after that you can calculate how can you try to fit the quadratic model or any other form that you can try. So yeah. The quadratic would become not, it would be a different modeling of the problem. Entirely. It will That's be a different be. modeling of the problem, yeah. So the way I'm calculating these parameters, B1, B, this mm -hmm. will change, okay? And apart from that, uh, you can add some weights to these features and there are other things that you can we, try. Of course, this makes sense only when we get into the details of the yeah, so I will come with the least square method next time and then we can uh, cover a few scenarios and probably I will look for some kind of data set where it will make more sense or we can visibly see how different scenario changes. Okay, can we do one thing, a request? Uh, so first of all, first of all uh, any other questions that you have before we go? Uh, thank you, this is a great session. This is exactly the sort of kind of discussion I want to have uh, over multiple sessions, mm -hmm. hopefully, and hopefully, uh, I will set up more like next time. Mm -hmm. Others will ask questions. Uh, I also want us all to be in a position where we are all able to understand the conversation around machine learning and deep learning, even if you are not implementing them in our concepts, mm -hmm. right? Uh, be able to quickly assess when somebody is explaining what's happening, yeah. right? And somebody is using that. So, even if you are not becoming an expert in doing this and building algorithms uh, i would pay attention to the the key concepts and i would like you or you or whoever talks about it in the subsequent sessions to keep the stress also on I and mean, while you while we do the discussions stress on the main concepts which are academically used often in conversation by people to describe the problems and so that when i hear this what do i really infer what has happened right mm -hmm. when i hear a loss function what does it mean when i hear they have used uh, so mm -hmm. which you are doing rightly actually today so that was nicely done and i want uh, you to keep that more in mind also as we go forward and if possible uh again this is a stretch goal uh, create a couple of posters around the key concepts which you talked about here only the key concepts not the details mm -hmm. And even if it means these are the key concepts, uh, I forget, generative, discriminative, mm. uh, what was that first thing you talked about? Decision boundaries, boundaries mm. right? Uh, hypothesis function. Hypothesis function. Put so those, supervised learning, what all define that yeah. one line definition or something that just serves as a reminder of what mm. this is. Mm. Create a big poster, put it in the map.
right? A couple of such posters, okay? And then the next time somebody talks about something else, uh, add to that, right? Add one more poster. So I just want this to be in your DNA that uh, this is as good as, you know, object overloading, operator overloading, uh, inheritance, mm -hmm. polymorphism, uh, which traditionally from programming perspective, uh, when we were doing functional programming or whatever object oriented programming we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. stretch code, please, if you can help. Okay. Or anybody else can have, I guess. Steve. <laughs> Am I that obvious? Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 the only thing I would, I would say to keep in mind is that a lot of people today use ML and AI interchangeably, but they're really not. Uh, ML is an approach to solving AI problems, but it's not the only approach. So course, yeah. uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. This was a great thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yes. How much in detail we want to go in all of these algorithms? You saw the because discussion today, right? Then deep learning will take next year, probably, <laughs> till the time we reach there. <laughs> Maybe you want to read a little bit. I no, I, again, uh, uh, yeah, having, just in case you want to. Yeah, because like with everything, like, like let's say we move to least square methods, there are serious shortcomings to that. Then after that comes LDA. Or I think that is fine. I think that is fine. If it takes six months for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every two weeks we have this session for two hours, not every mm -hmm. week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to share the load across, right? Mm -hmm. So you, I heard uh, Nitish and uh, Pradeep speak very eloquently today, mm -hmm. uh, helping you in uh, defining and creating this. So if the three of you can share load and others, if you want to, right, mm -hmm. uh, of topics, right? Mm -hmm. So next time you don't have to necessarily talk about it. Even if the flow is something you have in mind, Nitish can talk about it or Pradeep can talk about it or you guys can decide and pick and choose or somebody else. Let's talk about it. But we want to do it properly, right? We want, want to do it properly. Understand. We want yeah. to we want to be able to and honestly, if you don't at some point people don't find the use of being here, don't come here, right? Or give mm -hmm. feedback how we can change this. But yes, we should do, we like should entity. learn. Yeah. We should really yeah, but if you don't apply it to a problem, you forget it. Right? And that's another yeah. brilliant point, right? So, so this is where some some of you have to sort of start making it oh, if it can. makes sense. I, I'm not saying we dive mm -hmm. ourselves over there, but if it makes sense. Uh, give us a hello world problem to also do so that we can do that. So we will install this lap Actually, I actually will... if you guys are interested and you're interested in real life problems, uh, visit this web website called Kaggle. Kaggle. Yeah. Yeah. Kaggle. Yeah. But and those they have problems. Plenty, I'll tell you, plenty and plenty of problems and they have competition. Yeah. So you, you can even start off with a small problem and see how you do. Well, maybe we get there in a few weeks from now. Yeah, right? Kaggle might be very uh, soon. Right? Yes, link actually, what you, can, the... what you guys can do is like, uh, mm -hmm. I have the MATLAB set up for yeah. 2009 because it does need a license and I have the activation key and all that. I can share that. Yes. We never said that. We never said that. It's okay. We never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so with that set up, you can start. MATLAB user. Yeah, yeah, let's use that. Ah, let's use that. We can start with that. I should be free. I will be free. I will be free. I will be free. Yeah. So let's use that. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Okay. So then again, so we can start with there, like, and start playing with something, start plotting data, or like there are every almost all these languages they have inbuilt machine learning toolboxes over there. Okay. R, R is using very them. popular with uh, data scientists because of its so it's very powerful, and many of the algorithms we discussed right now, the initial some of the initial implementations were actually done. Actually, with MATLAB okay. and Octave also, it's also there. But uh, like R is mostly used in the data science context, and but we usually see in the NLP or like machine learning, MATLAB and Octave are the standard okay. tools. Sometimes I feel. Well, yeah, basic algorithms you can use anyway. You can use. Java, you will be, yeah, we do yeah, use in Java. Java. Yeah. 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 So okay. yeah, there are toolboxes in both the <coughs> platforms, and uh, so there is a statistical. You create a wiki page which is all. Yep. Yeah. Are we also gonna have uh, like discussion? This was like very data science intensive. Are we also gonna have discussion on inference, logical inference, the basics of data? What does it mean? I don't even know what is happening. Like, uh, like directive reasoning and all that. So again, it's like we are merging them. Logical yeah. inference, directive reasoning. He's moving to a separate part. Separate oh, part, yeah. This is like very, very no, data you're... science intensive. So, so are we also going to cover that part? Is from just Let's do that. I mean, but step at a time, step at a time. Let's start. You tell me. I mean, you guys are the expert. You tell me what should be covered first and how do we take the flow, right? I think I'm here to learn. Logic reasoning and all that should be kept separate as of now. 
when we are dealing with all these machine learning models and everything that will in itself come with its own algorithms and own problems yeah. it will be too much confusion you like more prominent terms <laughs> so i understand we could we could sequence it so that we finish this and actually the thing is in different universities i understand like why he's talking because there is a very different perspective to how that machine learning oh, yeah, course yeah. happens and well, i mean if you yeah if you say ai then you do like a little bit and yeah. have this yeah. influencing and everything really yes like But right now, what we are doing. Is so I think, I think <laughs> first let's do it. Honestly yeah, speaking, because our our bigger problem to solve is from a data science perspective, right? I think we should first learn how to be data scientists, right? Uh, and then talk about to AI and all of those things, yeah. right? Because uh, those inference logic. If there was a second parallel thread of such education, I would like to have. Is again, and we can vote for that. But right now, it's very confusing. <coughs> no, 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 no. I'm not talking about AI. I'm talking about completely different in a in in a. More software engineering space, which I already talked about last time we said here, which I wanted all of you to upskill yourself with on Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes cloud. Kubernetes. I mean, Kubernetes extended to cloud. Hmm. And again, I am expecting that session to be very discussion focused, and that one we will be probably more uh, hands on, hmm. right? Uh, where it's not about theoretical stuff, right? Hmm. In fact, in that session, you can all come in and become first class sort of citizens on Kubernetes world, and because. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm. I I, I don't because remember whether it was Nidhi or somebody else. Yeah, but I was uh, stressing on the fact that the concepts also matter. So uh, which concepts? The concepts of Kubernetes. microservices uh, architecture. You decide. So you start with that, right? Like she started today with the basic concept yeah. of ML. You I, start I with the that, concepts yeah. of microservices. But then the idea is to take it along the next level where we actually start understanding Kubernetes pods. Yeah. Everybody should be sort sort of the way everybody hopefully is, and don't tell me if you're not. Able to do Java Hello Worlds in their systems right now, right? We should be able to do Kubernetes Hello World on any cloud infrastructure, right? So maybe at least something that all of this team should become comfortable in setting up maybe one Java service and one Node.js service, right? So one Apache service and one Node.js service, which is a Hello World uh, on software and Amazon. Or you decide one. Basically, Kubernetes is what we want, right? The behind the scenes, we are just using the hardware. We are not using any of their infrastructure things. So, given a set of hardware, can I set up a Kubernetes-based cluster? And I don't even know what that means. You have okay. to help us understand what that means. It's not really hard. I'm not sure. Kubernetes. No, no, no. When if you want to try like build a hardware, uh, I think you need a like a. Platform that then now you can you can easily build one on the Google Cloud platform to build the at that platform you easy to build the one Hello World and Google. No, 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 that, no, that's why it's not free, right? So what what do you no? So you for example, uh, so example, if you were to build a Kubernetes cluster, right? You could build it on a virtual sort of uh, set of machines, right? So you get three virtual machines on which you're trying to create a Kubernetes cluster. And after that, it's really you're dealing with the Kubernetes abstractions. You're not dealing with the actual hardware machines, right? You could, and if you really need machines, you could use software, right? So then there are two bare metal machines or three bare metal machines across which we want to build a real cluster. But I'm saying we won't even need to get that far. I'm saying that most likely Kubernetes, when you download, they have a local sort of virtual uh, Kubernetes mini cube. They call it. So you build your own platform, you mean? No, you you learn the concepts of how to build these pods and everything, whatever it is. I don't know anything besides the term pods. Uh, on top of Docker and all of that, using Kubernetes, you you learn the concepts of how you do. I don't know auto scaling, how you do uh, configuration of your Kubernetes cluster, how do you do load balancing? All of those concepts is what I'm talking. About. That doesn't need you to be on a real platform. You can do it on a virtual on a single node desktop also. Using. They work their way to command just to run the command. They are very good. That they they if they plan pass made it really easy to use. Yeah, so, that's yeah. what I'm saying. So okay. through example, it's like learning shell script. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Right. Everybody had to learn shell script when they first became computer scientists. Right. Started uh, using. So I'm basically saying how to speed up that curve of learning everything to do with Kubernetes. Uh, <coughs> As fast as possible, and then starting with the theoretical concepts. Right? 
think about it. I mean, uh, do we have a rough estimate uh, when will the education of Kubernetes happen? No, I'm not giving you pressure. I just make sure that I prioritize my new machine setup correctly because with this machine, there's no way I can do any hands-on on Kubernetes. Uh, you can. No, it doesn't even run Docker, this, this, oh, this old machine. Another, yeah, yeah. yeah, I need to set up my new machine, which takes me some time to do it. Right? I think the next session will be theoretical anyway. So let's say we do a session in two weeks from now. It will oh, be okay. a theoretical concept. But so in a month from now, when, month from when now. I anticipate, okay. we will do a hands-on. Great. Right. Thank you. You expect to get your machine now. <laughs> yeah, the machine? Yes. Oh, set it up now. <laughs> yeah, up because I have something to block. To, yeah, uh, uh, development work that that block hung, and I have to finish up first, and okay. then I'll set up my machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you, thank you so thank much you. for joining thank on call. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. We need. Thank you. Hope you're feeling better. We need. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. So, would you like to share your live stream with everyone on YouTube? YouTube? <laughs> yeah. I think they have better though. Hmm? I think they have better mixes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I don't mind doing it. Like, yeah. If you make one to make the world better place by educating everybody, and awesome. And awesome. Yeah, awesome. People outside, yeah, IBM can know about you. Yeah. 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 yeah sure. Yeah. And I'm not a partner of Google. Or I don't get any payment. Yeah, I'm just no, 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 no. Yeah. I was and thinking. hopefully they don't put any uh, yeah, 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 thanks. So one okay. thing we can learn the language first and then add the okay. thing.